Hello. Good afternoon. Um, we still have people coming in, which is wonderful, but I would like to start sharp with this uh, wonderful event. So to all those of you who are already with us, welcome. Welcome to this first of a series of dialogues with the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union, co-organized with the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels. I should say that as a member of the EU Parliament and member of the European Parliamentary Alliance Against Hunger and Malnutrition, I am very, very happy to moderate this event. Um, together with our distinguished speakers and panelists, we will discuss uh, today, this afternoon, uh, the importance of inclusive territorial approaches to promote sustainable food systems and healthy diets. Has mentioned, this dialogue is aligned with the Food Systems Summit that the Secretary General Antonio Guterres will convene this year as a United Nations initiative to maximize the co benefits of a food systems approach across the entire 2030 agenda. Um, Portugal and the entire European Union are fully committed to this agenda. FAO facilitates this dialogue as part of its uh, lead role in this pathway for a global transformation. Um, before getting into our speakers, allow me to share some, some housekeeping rules. I think you can all see in the screen. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, let you know that we are having uh, one-way interpretation uh, uh, from English into Portuguese. So please tune in to your preferred language at the bottom of your screen, okay? Um, I also would like to say that this event is being recorded and the recording will be available on the FAO Brussels web page, web page sorry, uh, which will be included in the follow-up of this event. Um, we encourage you to share your thoughts with us and to interact with each other. Just make sure that you are in the right setting when you're commenting as indicated by FAO colleagues in the chat box. Okay, so also uh, I think you would like to know that when tweeting about this event, uh, don't forget to use the hashtag food systems and U2021 PT, okay? Right, so opening our event today, we have uh, our dear friend, Rodrigo de la Puerta, director of the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels for welcoming remarks. And then I'll go to Mr. Bruno Dimas, deputy director general for planning policies and general administration. Uh, from the Portuguese Ministry of Agriculture. And for the concluding remarks, I'll be uh, wrapping up the, the event. So I will now pass the floor to Rodrigo de la Puerta, Director of the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels for his welcoming remarks to everybody. Rudy, Rodrigo, go ahead. Querida Isabel, eh, muito obrigado, boa tarde. Eh, muito obrigado por ter aceito moderar o nosso evento de hoje. Caras amigas e amigos, agradeço profundamente a presença de todos neste evento e, em especial, a parceria da presidência portuguesa na organização de um evento sobre um tema tão importante e atual. Com a vossa atualização, passo ao inglês. Eh, dear friends, two of the major challenges of our times are malnutrition in all its forms and the degradation of the environment and natural resources. Both are happening at an accelerated pace and both are totally interconnected. The State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, what we call SOFI 2020, shows that almost 700 million people went hungry in 2019, up by 10 million from 2018 and nearly 60 million in five years. COVID-19 is just making things worse. As progress is in fighting hunger stalls, COVID-19 is intensifying the vulnerabilities of global food systems, understood as all those activities affecting the production, the distribution, and the consumption of food. 
while it is too soon to assess the full impact of lockdown measures in various countries, the SOFI reports estimate that up to 132 more million um, people may have gone hungry in 2020 due to the economic recession triggered by COVID-19. Poor quality diets are a major contributing factor to the rising prevalence of malnutrition in all its forms, from undernourishment to obesity. And the affordability of food is also an issue due to the cost of food or also to the inadequate income. The result is horrible. More than 3 billion people do not have access to enough healthy or nutritious food. As I just mentioned, the way we produce food is taking a toll on our natural resources. For example, food production accounts for the use of 48% and 70% of land and freshwater resources, respectively, at the global level. There is no time to waste in transforming our food systems to protect our planet while improving our lives. Topics such as food security and nutrition, poverty, biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas emissions will be high on the 2021 international agenda, particularly as Isabel was mentioning at the UN Food System Summit to be convened by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in September. As noted by the UN Secretary General, it is unacceptable that hunger is increasing at a time when the world is wasting more than 1 billion tons of food every year. It is time to change the way we produce and consume food, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions. FAO's Director General Chi dong Yu also points out that the exponential growth of obesity and overweight is having a broad impact on all regions of the world across gender, economic, and age categories. Food systems transformation involve key issues, such as one, the strengthening of family farming, which accounts for 80% of all food produced globally, two, fighting the consumption of unhealthy foods, and three, the enhancement of territorial agricultural food systems, the theme being discussed today, with reinforcement of food resilience and local development. In these three areas, Portugal, particularly now at the helm of the EU Council, uh, has proven to be an active player to promote sustainable and territorial food systems for healthier diets. On family farming, Portugal has been a leading voice on the global stage since the International Year of Family Farming in 2014. During the UN decade for family farming, uh, 2019 to 2028, the country plays an active role in the group of friends, a selected group of nations that drives the family farming agenda at the international level. Since then, Portugal has pushed for the negotiations of the Lisbon Charter for strengthening of family farming, a commitment from Portuguese speaking countries, the CPLP. Concerning the fight in obesity, the combination of unhealthy diets and the increase in sedentary lifestyle has inspired a public health campaign against childhood obesity in Portugal. With relation to the enhancement of territorial and sustainable food systems, Portugal is also supporting through its Ministry of Agriculture, the development of local food policies and respective governance structures in several municipalities in the country. Before uh, passing the floor to the speakers, I would like to commend uh, the European Union for its efforts towards the promotion of territorial sustainable food systems for healthy diets in its member states and beyond. The Farm to Fork strategy launched last year, as all of you know, as part of the European Green Deal, sets the stage for a comprehensive policy architecture designed to change the current global food systems paradigm. paradigm. The Farm to Fork also emphasizes the role of farmers in tackling the challenges of the transition towards more sustainable agriculture. The Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, is proud to team up with the EU, with Portugal, to put forward the Farm to Fork as the UN Food Systems Summit is expected to pave the way for food systems transformation globally. Thanks again so much for being here today. Querida Isabel, paso te a palabra. 
Muitíssimo obrigada, Rodrigo. Muito obrigada pelas tuas notas de abertura. Uh, now we have the welcoming remarks from Bruno Dimas. So, Bruno Dimas, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Obrigado. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we, we live in a world uh, full of needs, inequalities and contradictions that uh, need to have a solution. As Mr. La Huerta has uh, made mention to some figures, but it's not a waste of time to underline that the world produces enough food to feed it, its entire population. But about 690 million people suffer food insecurity, 800 million live in extreme poverty, and more than 1.5 billion people cannot afford a diet that meets the required levels of essential nutrients. Uh, at the same time, our food systems are often related to biodiversity loss, over whose natural reserves and HG emissions. Moreover, half of, of the adult population are now overweight, contributing to a high prevalence of non-communicable disease and related healthcare costs. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated malnutrition and poverty especially among the most vulnerable people. The urgency for action led the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, to launch the United Nations Summit on Food Systems to be held in September 2021, to give a boost to the realization of the 2030 agenda and the achievement of its 17 sustainable development goals. The Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union says the moment to, to join the global effort to the realization of the United Nations Agenda 2030 and to contribute to a successful uni, United Nations Summit on Food System, joining FAO through the liaison office in Brussels to promote this video conference on territorial food systems. I would therefore like to thank the director of the FAO office in Brussels, Rodrigo Lapuerta, and all its team for organizing this webinar. I also want to thank Mr. Isabel Carvalhais, member of the European Parliament, and Mr. Leonard Mizzi from the European Commission, Mr. Benjamin Davis of FAO, Mrs. Simplice Noale of African Union, and to Mr. Francesco Rampa, a special advisor for the Italian G20 presidency, who agreed to participate and give their contribution to this conference. I'd also like to refer the important rule that CPLP, the community of Portuguese speaking countries, has played in the search for solutions to eradicate anger in its nine countries, covering a total population of about 219 million inheritance. Indeed, the CPLP launched its food and nutrition security strategy, a major instrument for coordinate action to combat food insecurity in CPLP. Through that strategy, the CPLP constituted the Food and Nutritional Security Council and paved the way for the constitution of nine national councils instruments of fundamental importance for coordinating multi-sectoral multi action in which civil society, the private sector and the academia have an important role. Also, family farming plays a major role in CPLP agriculture. The community developed the voluntary guidelines on family farming approved in 2017 and Lisbon Charter on family farming signed in in 2018 by CPLP agriculture ministers bound the commitment to apply the guidelines in all member states, which is an important milestone in the fight against anger in the Portuguese speaking country. A video produced by the Executive Secretary of CPLP presenting the work developed within the scope of the CPLP food and nutrition security strategy will be presenting during this session. I am grateful to CPLP and to its cooperation director, Manuel Lepão, for sharing that video for this seminar. Finally, I am grateful to all participants which an enlightening and useful session. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Bruno Dimas. Uh, now uh, we will move on our panel by, by setting the scene with two very special panelists. There you have, yeah, now you can see. We'll have Leonard Mizi, who is the head of unit for sustainable agri-food systems and fisheries in the new EU Commission Directorate General for International Partnerships, uh, DG INTPA and FAO's Director of the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equity Division, Benjamin Davis. Uh, following their interventions, Dr. Simplice Noala, uh, African Union Commission's Head of Division for Agriculture and Food Security, will also join the debate. And his intervention will be followed by Francesco Rampa, Senior Expert for Sustainable Development and Food Systems for the Italian G20 Presidency and Member of Sustainable Food Systems Programme of, of the European Centre for Development Policy Management. Okay, uh, so let's turn now to Leonard. Okay, uh, Leonard, um, we know that the EU Farm to Fork strategy is at the very heart of the European Green Deal and has the primary objective of accelerating the use transition to a more sustainable food system. But this goal, this objective is also pre present in the use partnerships all over the world, including the cooperation with African, Caribbean and Pacific states. So could you please help us to learn more on this EU commitment to support a global level, at the global level, sorry, the transition to more sustainable, to uh, green and just food systems and how it will contribute to the UN Food Systems Summit process and its goals. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Isabel, and thank you to Rodrigo. And thank you to the uh, Portuguese presidency. Uh, I think coming uh, from uh, a very tough year of COVID and we're still experiencing COVID uh, and we will continue experiencing in the months ahead, even with the rollout of the vaccine. I think it's um, a wake up call to put agri-food systems also at the core of the international agenda because we often forget that uh, agri-food systems following or after health and vaccines is probably the most um, complex and uh, affected sector in the whole economy. Um, you mentioned a lot the UN Food System Summit. There is also a big event coming up in Tokyo, which is the Nutrition for Growth, which focuses on nutrition. And Isabel and Rodrigo and uh, the Portuguese presidency we as European Union, EU 27, with the institutions, we need to show leadership in the run up to the UN Food System Summit so that we are transformational. Isabel mentioned the farm to fork. Um, we have the EU Green Deal, but we also need to make this more granular, more practical in terms of what we want to achieve. You all know that we come out from a multi-financial framework 2014-2020. So this ends the cycle of programming. And in December, um, the European Parliament, the Council agreed on the new NDG instrument, which is the instrument 2021-2027. And we are at the core these very days and the coming weeks to start outlining the national, multi-country, and global public goods, which will shape and which will basically be the ammunition of the farm to fork and the EU Green Deal for the next programming period. And I'll give you a bit of ideas. Nothing is yet agreed, but I'll give you a bit of pistes, a bit of pathways where we can contribute together with the EU member states, because as um, uh, Bruno mentioned, we are already this week going to have a first round of discussions on the council conclusions on the UN Food System Summit. And we want council conclusions which are robust and ambitious. Sometimes council conclusions are pretty general. We want these to be very ambitious. A call for action 
which will also show the way of how the European Union wants to come up with concrete solutions. And this is linked to also to the topic of territorial food systems and linking to the action tracks because the UN food systems has action tracks. We start with nutrition. Action track one, nutrition. We have a big portfolio which culminated already in 2019 with commitments of around 3.5 billion. And the other commitment is the commitment to reduce stunting by 7 million. Now, we also know that COVID will increase the number of wasted kids, will increase the number of stunted kids. Hence, the need to continue building up, also linked to the commitments of this new commission, to focus more and more on human development. Because evidently, COVID also has created and will create more shocks on gender, on youth, on the possibilities of youth to engage, but also on healthy, nutritious diets. So the need for a more holistic approach, for example, between rural areas, secondary cities, urban centers becomes very crucial. You can't have um, supply chains, and we experienced this in the first wave. No, I mean, it's you, can't, you can't have uh, robust food systems if you don't have good supply networks, even if you speak about short supply circuits, these need to be integrated with good connectivity, with good rural infrastructure, with supply chains which have also um, uh, cold supply chains, storage, uh, and reduction of basic uh, food waste and losses. So this is going to be key uh, in terms of the transformation agenda. Um, a clear call that Europe and its member states will continue also to commit on nutrition. This will be one of the big challenges once the financing is uh, wrapped up uh, in terms of national, multi-country and global programming that uh, we will continue hopefully with the political decisions taken at the highest level by commissioners to actually signal a commitment towards uh, nutrition and agri-food system. Secondly, um, the question of inclusiveness. A territorial approach needs also to be an inclusive approach. Inclusive because COVID has also exposed imbalances across the value chain. What we are trying to do, for example, we had already this morning the um, continuation of our discussions on cocoa, um, we're speaking here about two countries, but it can be replicated not only to cocoa, eventually to other agri-food products, is what we are trying to construe around deforestation. So this would be um, baseline analysis to also stop, halt deforestation. As you know, the G environment will come up with a legislative proposal later on this year on deforestation free value chains linked also to the concept of living incomes, living wages, but also to the work that DigiJust is going to do. And, and this is also a big flagship um, for this year that FAO and ILO will continue working is on child labor. So a labor, um, a human rights approach, uh, tackling child labor, especially in cocoa value chains, and evidently a rebalancing of the cocoa value chain uh, for farmers' income, using as a baseline the living income differential that the two countries of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana are doing. So this is what we are trying to construe under a concrete value chain and evidently big challenges under other value chains which need to be thought of if we get the cocoa value chain correct. Now, evidently, any cocoa value chain or any agriculture value chain needs to accompany it by private financing. No territorial approach or no diverse diet can be done just by grants or budget support on its own. It has to be accompanied also by private sector investment. And this is also a call for financial institutions because the experience that we had until now is rather timid. Financial institutions, including European financial institutions, I'm speaking about development finance here, are still somewhat risk averse to invest in agricultural value chains. They are risk averse because it's too risky, too complicated to invest 
um, to the benefit of small farm holders because the transaction costs are high. The benefits of investing in fragmented uh, agri-value chains are too complicated. The, the risking element is, is high. So what we are trying to do with the FAO Investment Center, with EFAD, uh, we also unveiled the fund, which is the Horuma Fund with ACID in Spain, but also our own portfolio of the AgriFi with the EDFIs is to look at smaller ticket sizes. Ticket sizes, which are in the 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 range, so that we can risk and, and de risk small farm holders, su supporting also farmers' organizations, because without strong farmers' organizations, without strong cooperative movements, that value addition, that added value, and that return on investment will not happen and financial institutions will not necessarily de risk. So a territorial food systems approach, which puts at the core also a new way of de-risking agriculture, but evidently financial institutions need to do much more than they have done to date. And last but not least, the need to continue coordinating more on food crisis hotspots. This is being done with FAO, with WFP, with uh, other partners, including USAID, on a national, multi-country, global approach to food crisis hotspots coordination via the global report on food crisis. Food crisis hotspots risk increasing. We look around from the Yemen's to the South Sudan's to the Somalia's, uh, desert locusts, pests and diseases, and evidently the challenges around pandemics, um, uh, and evidently a need to refocus on, 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 on one health, where at the core of all this research innovation needs to be um, more and more prioritized. Once again, territorial approaches require a strong embedding of research, innovation, and the digital transformation agenda. So Isabel, this is a bit the pathway that we want to enter, evidently with a stronger focus on modalities around acroecology, scaling up our, our projects like what we are doing under the ZIRA on the water, land, energy nexus, and putting at the core the values that the EU Green Deal um, has, has already outlined. So a plea to the Portuguese presidency, a plea also interinstitutionally between us the parliament and the other institutions to also construe uh, dialogues. I would welcome any dialogue that Portugal wants to host. We are in contact with a number of member states, but we are also thinking of um, rallying behind the services, but also um, approaching the European parliament so that hopefully we can organize a Brussels-based dialogue, which will also link to the national dialogues that our member states will start rolling out from February, March until um, the pre-summit in June. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard, for your insights and, and for sharing with us the youth vision in this regard. Uh, let me now turn to Benjamin Davis. Uh, FAO is one of the leading UN agencies regarding food systems transformation. Now, Benjamin, Inclusivity becomes fundamental for the summit's goals, not only to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all, but also to advance equitable livelihoods. Just to mention two of the five action tracks of the summit. Why, and why a territorial approach is important in this regard? Great, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And uh, I also want to thank first the, the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels, as well as the Portuguese Presidency for organizing this important event and, and for inviting me. Um, as a prelude to answering that question, I'd like to just, I'd like to second perhaps what Leonard was uh, emphasized in his, in his short presentation around the importance of concrete solutions, um, the, the importance of focusing on livelihoods and human development in a, in a transformational agenda. Now, I think a lot of the, the food system transformation discussion, um, a lot of the big narrative has been around, you know, the importance of healthy diets, of a transformation which is environmentally sustainable, addressing climate change, et cetera, et cetera. but the, the concept of inclusivity is central. It's fundamental. 
And it's fundamental because food system transformation has um, enormous economic and social implications. Um, around, I mean, back of the envelope calculations that, uh, that we've made around 4.5 billion people depend on food systems, at least in part for their livelihoods. And this is family farmers, small scale producers, workers, migrants, business owners, et cetera, all along the value chain from, far, from, from the far, farm to the consumer. And over a billion people live in moderate and extreme poverty uh, in, in rural areas, again, most involved in the, in the, in the food system. Uh, prior to, to COVID-19, and of course, the numbers have increased dramatically, as we know, with COVID-19. Um, now, in, uh, food security has also worsened dramatically. Inequality has also significantly worsened. Um, the numbers from Latin America, for example, are, are stratospheric in terms of the increases in income inequality uh, from, from the economic uh, recessions caused by, by, by COVID which compounds the inequality in access to services, to health services and to formal employment. And so COVID-19 has really unmasked an inequality that was always there, but we can't really hide anymore. And this is very important long-term consequences. For example, in terms of the increases in child labor, as uh, Leonard referred to, as well as a lower development trajectory going into the future, unless we take uh, direct action. Um, and all of this is very important just to the success of the very concept of food system transformation. Because on the one hand, we need to think about the incomes that are necessary in order to, to, buy, to access these healthy diets and the livelihoods that can drive and be supported by the sustainable development of agriculture and, and rural areas. And there isn't, there's nothing inherently inclusive about food system transformation or the economic transformation, whether it's agricultural, rural, or, or structural, uh, that drives it. In fact, it tends to be exclusive and inequality producing. And so to make it inclusive requires political will, legal and institutional reforms that strengthen transparency and accountability, uh, empower local communities, especially most vulnerable groups, you know, including women, youth and indigenous peoples, again, as Leonard was mentioning, producer organizations, so they can participate in the policy and, and the planning processes. Second, a successful food system transformation relies on the economic decisions of hundreds of millions of, of economic agents, many of whom are, are poor and vulnerable, marginalized. And so we need to understand the barriers and the constraints that they face, the structural challenges in terms of access to education, uh, uh, technical skills, land, water, et cetera, missing markets, uh, market failure, um, et cetera, in order to make the, the process of food system transformation um, successful. Now the Food System Summit Action Track 4 on, on advancing equ uh, equitable livelihoods, uh, to me it's on, it's, on, it's on track, right? It's, it's recognizing the central role of building agency of, of these different groups, again, that I've mentioned, but also including uh, seasonal laborers, um, disabled, et cetera, that are most limited by current uh, food system practices, changing power relations within food systems and transforming structures that perpetuate this exclusion. Um, but I think we need to make sure that that discussion is also infused within the other action tracks of the food, of the food system summit and the process as a whole. Now, the choices on how we promote and govern food system transformation are, are very important in terms of promoting these issues around agency power relations and, um, and structural issues. Um, and it's important that this approach needs to be people centered um, to ensure the agency of the poor and the vulnerable it needs to be multi-stakeholder to address the power inequities in place space to take into account the heterogeneity of socioeconomic and environmental conditions and situations. And to leverage actions, again, as Leonard mentioned, uh, along the rural urban continuum and cross sector right? So it's quite a complex, it's, it's quite a complex process. But these are all the characteristics which um, uh, the territorial approaches to development um, take into account and which uh, gets us to the importance of, of what we're discussing today. It's that way of bringing everything together in an approach um, that's place-based and spatially based, um, uh, which is important. Um, and it's key to make sure that the, to making sure that food systems transformation uh, will advance equitable livelihoods. Um, so territorial approaches, um, they tend to import, they should uh, stress the importance of negotiation, consensus building and conflict resolution. And by doing so, they can influence um, inclusive decision-making, empower local populations through formal and informal um, organizations and networks. Now, for many years, we've been working on uh, territorial development approaches in different contexts, but really it, now it seems as though the time has come uh, for territorial development. Uh, the UN Decade on Family Farming promotes a territorial approach 
um, bringing in family farmers as key agents of, of territorial de uh, development. Uh, within FAO in Latin America, we've started the Cien Territorios Initiative, um, which is a strategy which helps to focus on um, the most lagging and vulnerable rural territories in the region um, and do territorial uh, uh, plans to tackle the specific causes of poverty and inequality in the poorest ter 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 territories in the region. We've, all, we've also been working over the past few years to bring together landscape management and territorial development approaches. And so these two have different entry points, um, but they're both place-based and they have strong emphasis on the multi-stakeholder governance, cross-sectoral coordination and multi-level um, actions. They're, ve they're very complementary and, and cross-disciplinary. And we've taken undertaken case studies to better understand how we can how these how these are implemented in practice in country level and how they can be brought together. Um, and we're working um, to develop guidelines as to how to um, further integrate these approaches um, across different dimensions. We're also uh, working closely with partners, including the European Commission, CERAD, GIZ, BMZ, and NEPAD, and others uh, around um, the territorial perspectives for development, the TP4D. Alliance uh, in 2018. And so this initiative is aimed at developing a common understanding of territorial approaches and a wider alliance between practitioners, researchers, international organizations, governments, in terms of bringing in territorial perspectives and how it's done in terms of policy program um, design and implementation. Um, this past year with uh, GIZ and BMZ, uh, we've reconvened this initiative to learn from these experiences reflect on a, an exercise that GI said has led on behalf of uh, TP4D uh, to reflect on this integration of territorial and landscape and landscaping approaches. Um, we're also working on a method of finalizing a methodology to, um, to focusing on bottom up uh, territorial diagnos di uh, diagnosis of food systems and participatory development of uh, different uh, territorial development plans. Again, focusing on the empowerment of the most vulnerable so they have a stronger role in food systems transformation. FAO's hand in hand also has a territorial perspective, but an interesting part of this initiative is the creation of this geospatial platform, which has a, a large and rich set of spatially disaggregated data on food and agriculture, agroclimatic conditions and natural resources, which can help uh, strengthen evidence-based decision-making um, in the food and agricultural sectors and the, and the food system transformation. And it's a, it's a public good, which will allow us to help uh, give an evidence base to these territorial um, approaches. Now, the weakest part of this platform, and really more generally in terms of the availability of spatially disaggregated data, as well as I think within the food system transformation narrative in general, is really around the socioeconomic characteristics, the welfare, poverty, food security, and, and livelihoods. And so we're working hard to try to bring in spatially disaggregated welfare data to combine with the vast data that, um, that the platform already has around agroclimatic and environmental um, dimensions. Um, and so we're working with groups who, who are looking at uh, socioeconomic data in alternative ways using machine learning, satellite imagery, et cetera. And so I think that the, the common understanding of the importance of, um, of adopting territorial approaches in terms of the context of the Food Systems Summit and the implementation of the EU's food to fork strategy is, is fundamental. And so first, because far from reducing the approach to the local level, uh, it allows the food systems to be brought into um, the multiple levels of spatial organization, connecting the local, the regional, and the national skills. Um, and secondly, just because of the, the heterogeneity that defines um, food systems in all these different, different contexts. Um, in, our, in, my mind, in our mind, they're the most viable option to address the integrated nature of most SDGs related with food systems, since they can bring in all these different elements. We've been working closely with the TP4D partners, including the, the Commission, um, as well as GIZ, other bilateral, multilateral partners, including Portugal and the community of, of Portuguese speaking countries to pilot these territorial approaches in the context of the 2030 agenda. And so we feel that Portugal and the African member countries of the CPLP can play a very important role in terms of scaling up this approach um, and taking into consideration um, this partnership. And so we'd be very happy to continue to support the EU and the other interested member countries in being involved in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. This gave us really a really a good overview of the sustained uh, importance of leaving no one behind. Uh, I remind you at this stage that uh, uh, once again, this event is being recorded 
and recording will be sent to you via email in the follow-up of this event. Uh, in the meantime, uh, do use the question and answers box uh, you see at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, just make sure you indicate your name, your organization, and for which panelist the question is, okay? Um, FAO colleagues will also include these instructions in the chat box, so you, if you are attentive to that, you will see. Um, our expert panelists are, are very much looking forward to answer your questions, so go ahead, don't hesitate. Now, moving on, I would like to continue our discussion with Dr. Simplice Noala. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly, okay? Um, Simplice, assuring access to healthy diets for all in Africa uh, constitutes, as we know, a major challenge. In this regard, decentralization and unsustainable food systems become key pillars. The Rural Economy and Agriculture Department of the African Union provides an overall guidance in this regard. So, simply, we are eager to hear your contribution. Go ahead. Th th thank you very much and thank you for inviting us to this uh, very important discussion. And now, I, I will start by saying, despite the numerous initiatives, programs, that have been implemented on the continent, either by the African Union, the regional economic communities, the national governments, or the international communities, hunger is on the rise on the continent. In, in 2019, almost one fifth of the population on the continent suffered from malnutrition, and if you add another 400 million people suffering from moderate food insecurity, you see how the situation is. And COVID-19, and this has been said by Leonard, COVID-19 would push about 80 million more people on the continent to this group. Now, the, the question is, how do the continent address the numerous challenges posed by food insecurity, food and nutrition insecurity, in order to achieve the Agenda 2063 uh, uh, objective and the Sustainable Goals objectives by 2030. Uh, we organized a meeting with our ministers in collaboration with FAO in July uh, uh, last year and one strong message came out from the, 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 the meeting. And the message was we need to accelerate the transformation of African agri-food system to be more resilient. And this should be done through the, the CADEP, uh, which is the Continental Agenda for Agricultural Transformation. Now, the, the question that I asked myself when I was requested to give a talk on decentralization it was what are these challenges that we need to address if we really want to achieve uh, the CADEP Malabo target by 2025. The, the first one is the challenge link to the process of the policy formulation and the strategy. Most often, these policies and strategies are agricultural focus uh, uh, policies or, or strategy. And by doing so, they are top-down approach, they are formulated at national level or a continental level with little or no articulation of the regional specificities or the uh, agroecological specificity of countries. Now, when we look at the various uh, programs that are being implemented, we have noted that these programs lack a lot of uh, coordination. And finally, if we want to transform agriculture, we need to address the issues related to access to input services 
and to infrastructure. I, I just pick these three that are simply, surely link to the issues of decentralization. I, I will not take you into the definition and uh, the advantages that decentralization offers. But we know that the real, the, the, the real advantage of having the central, a decentralized system is to facilitate or to improve the quality of life or the livelihood at local level. But most often, and I was quite impressed when I was asked to speak about this, is that when we speak decentralization, even within the African Union context, we, we don't link it directly to a cultural transformation or to, a, of, to food and nutrition security. We look at it more as a public democracy way of ruling countries without really looking at the impact that this can have on food and nutrition security. Whereas there are empiric evidence that decentralization has a strong impact on food and nutrition security. But having said this, if you unpack decentralization into the, what I would call the three main aspect of decentralization, that is the physical decentralization, the administrative decentralization, and the political decentralization, you, you will note that the, the first two, that is the, phys the fiscal decentralization, that is the ability to manage its resources, and the administrative de decentralization, that is the ability of taking decision, of making policy choice, have greater impact than the political decentralization, which is the ability of choosing their, their leaders. On, on the continent, decentralization is still an unfinished business because most of the time, people view decentralization as the, the ability for the local community to choose their leaders. This is done. And when, where it is advanced, the local communities are given the opportunity to make the policy choice. But what is lacking is the allocation and the management of the resources. And for us, this is really where we should act and we should act fast uh, as the continent. Unless we accelerate our decentralization processes, unless we allocate resources to the sub-national level, we may not achieve our goals of uh, ending hunger by 2025. But also, as, as the African Union, we, we are very keen uh, on that the centralization is not only a national affair, is also a continental, regional, why not a global affairs? And that is why we are working towards empowering member states to embark into the implementation of what is known as the uh, principle of subsidiarity. I think we should, as global partners, we should, as national government, start looking at what is it that is well done at which level and let that level do in it. And this will certainly give more resources to the local communities. This will certainly give more chances for the local community to take control of their policy choice and certainly have more development. And finally, what we are advocating, and this is something that we have been discussing, uh, which is at the heart of our partnership with the European Union. Uh, in 2019, our minister met in, 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 in Italy, our ministers in charge of uh, agriculture, and endorsed a political declaration and action agenda. And this action agenda 
really looks at Agisura transformation through the length of the rural transformation using the territorial approach. I think for us, this is something that we are pushing as a continent, we are pushing as a, a commission for all our member states to embark in the, uh, 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 this territorial approach for rural development as, as a way of achieving Agenda 2063 goals of ending hunger by 2025. Uh, I thank you here. I think I will be ready to provide more uh, clarification or more insight when it comes to the Q&A sessions. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Nuola, for your remarks, for your alerts and concerns. I, I would like now to turn to Francesco Rampa. Francesco, uh, the scale of this challenge demands an overall involvement of governments, international organizations, academia, citizens. Uh, what about the G20? Yeah, its membership, as we know, accounts for 60% of the world's population and about 75% of international trade. Could you please describe to us how the Italian presidency will include food, food systems in the 2021's G20 agenda and how this year could be a year of opportunity for the EU-Africa cooperation? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Isabel, uh, for the introduction and thanks to, to FAO and, and the Portuguese EU presidency. In fact, as you said, I'll be wearing two hats. Um, uh, my European Center for Development Policy hat, but as we ECDPM assist the, the presidency, it's important that I start uh, from your question on what are the plans by the Italians to address this very complicated agenda. Uh, and, and there I, I must uh, stress uh, a point that, that uh, uh, Leonard made on the importance of using COVID as an opportunity. The G20 presidency, unfortunately, like the Saudi presidency of the G20, must be framed in COVID uh, response. Uh, and that, of course, as, as, as uh, Leonard said, as uh, agriculture and food system at its, end, at its core, not only as, a, as an emergency, as a threat, but I would say um, it's very important to use this momentum uh, generated by a pandemic crisis, the fact that people and politicians are realizing the importance, uh, re rediscovering partly the importance of some basic uh, values uh, and, and try to, to focus the mind of people on the centrality of the food system and healthy diets, as our meeting today say, uh, to make sure that the, the life of people uh, improve uh, by also making sure that the life uh, of the planet uh, and, uh, and the animals and plants that live there are connected. So in that sense, I am hoping that COVID naturally can be used also as an opportunity to raise awareness about these interconnections with food system at their center. And the Italian presidency of the G20 has already announced uh, that the One Health approach uh, will be central, uh, both as an emergency uh, reaction and response, the G20 must help, especially low-income countries uh, respond to the pandemic. There is a big, big dossier, of course, about health per se with the, the vaccine and funding the vaccines, etc. But even um, as importantly, more in the medium and long term. Uh, so one health approach must be, uh, hopefully, we need to still agree with the G20 uh, at, at different levels, but one is the narrative to raise the awareness of the importance of One Health approach, but exploring in the different parts of the G20 agenda, what does it mean concretely? And there, the, the experience of Europe uh, and, and also, uh, to some extent, Europe Africa will be important. So we, we must make sure that we move from the understanding and the narrative of tackling uh, future challenges to a One Health approach to being quite concrete. And so there we will be getting the, the help also of organizations, of course, like FAO, WHO and others who are also working together in an in a, in a expert's panel, of course, on, on making the One Health approach very concrete. So that's a very important cross-cutting issue that will always <coughs> be at the center of the, of the Italian presidency. How do we deal with the food systems uh, and, and territorial, especially food systems uh, in, the, in the G20 presidency? Um, that's going to be featuring 
uh, if you want in uh, in two tracks i would say two work streams thematic work stream of the g20 uh, of course the agricultural ministers uh, uh, are, are an important part of the g20 meetings and agenda and preparations and they will be uh, trying to understand what is a common G20 position on, on the definition of sustainable food systems and they would like to agree on the possibility of contributing to the food system summit. So during the ministerial meeting of the G20 ministers in Italy, they will be having uh, certainly among one of the top three priority, a positive constructive contribution to the food system summit. Hopefully with a, a common understanding on, on what uh, food systems really mean because of course the G20 are very different countries of different size and, and challenges. Uh, not only the agricultural ministers will deal with this, but of course the development uh, working group, uh, the SDG agenda is dealt with in the G20 through a special group and a special, uh, the, it's called the development working group. And there, uh, I would say there are three important priorities, thematic sub-priorities that all, all of which are very important for food systems. And that's very important uh, that the Italian presidency is uh, leading that way. But we already last week got the uh, general endorsement uh, by the G20 Sherpas from the other countries that this is a very good direction. So three sub priorities part of the development working group. First of all, food security uh, and the importance of making sure the full multidimensional food systems everywhere contribute to food security. As, as, as others have said, the situation is very warning. Uh, it was already worsening food insecurity before and now with COVID is very dramatic. So that element of food security will be the object of uh, uh, decisions and discussion by the ministers of uh, foreign affairs and the ministers of development. For the first time they meet, they meet in, a, in a joint session for the first time in the G20 and the end of June in Matera and they will be discussing food security measures and coordination as a, as a priority. So that's in itself very important. Then uh, the, the Italian presidency will have other two priorities, uh, innovative financing for sustainable development and uh, uh, using and, and, and working with intermediary cities uh, as a, a crucial uh, way to implement at the local level the SDGs. Uh, these, as others have said, are very crucial uh, as as uh, Leonard before, and also colleagues from FAO mentioned, uh, financing is a paramount. Without uh, smart financing, both public and private, and also together, public and private financing, there cannot be really the transformation of food system that we all uh, intend to and, and aspire to through the SDG. So there, uh, we hope that the G20, like uh, started doing in, in 2020, the G20 will proceed further with the work for debt relief in some of the uh, emergency situations in low-income countries so to allow the fiscal space to react uh, to the COVID and that type of spending hopefully to be uh, devoted in particular to the building and uh, back better and greener uh, and not only achieve food security but try to put in place investment through that relief that can also uh, target food systems transformation. <clears throat> of course, the importance of uh, blending instruments will be crucial. So the Italian presidency under the innovative financing discussion will also uh, facilitate the understanding of how the G20 can have a policy convergence on uh, better aligning uh, private and blended finance streams towards sustainability and that clearly will also benefit sustainable food system spending. So that is very important uh, uh, and will benefit from the example of what the European Union is doing on its uh, external investment plan and how it's supporting African food system transformation. The second uh, sub-priority I want to quickly mention is, is intermediary cities. Of course, intermediary cities are very crucial, in particular in Africa. There are megalopolis, but we know how many millions of people and increasingly so live in secondary cities. It's a bit new, but obviously secondary cities are really at the connection between urban and rural area. They're very crucial for territorial food systems. So we hope that by G20 supporting, uh, understanding what is the role of uh, intermediary city, uh, both for the stronger food economy, but also as a frontline reaction to COVID the pandemic, etc. we can get a consensus amongst the G20 on strengthening the role of, uh, as we just heard very amply from the African Union, the role of intermediary uh, 
and local governance. And I hope that will also benefit strongly the building of uh, food economies. Let me also uh, say that now wearing maybe more my my ECDPM more independent hat, not uh, talking as a government uh, advisor. Uh, there are two, three areas where the European Africa cooperation can get stronger and use this 2020 mega summit year. Really, is every summit, every topic you could possibly mention will have to be discussed by leaders at the global level this year. And and and, and other other colleagues today mentioned them. I think in all of these global fora, at the G20. Obviously, South Africa is the only formal representative, but South Africa is very positively bringing always the importance of the whole continent. So South Africa is a very strong voice, partly uh, thanks to South Africa and the G20. But even within uh, the, the Tokyo Summit, the Food System Summit, COP26, Europe Africa can certainly have a progress, progressive alliance approach to try by numbers, by type of solution, by gravity of some of the situations in, in Africa, etc., put very strongly some of these agenda for territorial food systems and healthy diets. And, and colleagues have already mentioned to it, I think not only we have global summits, we have the EU, EU summit. So that is an opportunity to be very specific on what an alliance can mean. We have heard talking about an alliance on climate change between Europe and Africa, but why not an alliance on, on the importance uh, of territorial food systems? And I mean, that, that type of pressure could make the Europe-Africa partnership uh, very important to influence global outcomes and the more you can be specific at recognizing that of course europe and africa don't always have the same agenda certain things will be different but certain things are definitely of common interest on those common interests i think there's a lot that europe and africa can do and i would even add that the farm to four strategy as lena said is really a quite advanced uh, uh, ambitious agenda towards sustainable food systems so why not using that uh, quite amazing document to to spearhead not only the G20 if we can, but even uh, in the conversation with the, Europe, with the African Union to try to go towards the same direction and try to create an alliance and the Fund to Force strategy also speaks of green alliances to contribute with external action by Europe to uh, important transformation of food systems worldwide. Why not using that Fund to Fork and Green Alliance aspiration to build the Europe-Africa alliance starting maybe with example sectoral example like uh, coco mentioned before but really going beyond and try to have a positive influence because trade ultimately and using the power of europe in, in as a major worldwide uh, the largest food market and food importer by using the power of trade policy in europe in discussion in conversation with african colleagues could really make an incentives change also in international trade to help transform towards sustainable food systems. So I would say that certain agenda items are very big. The last one I want to mention is spending better the money. There is this big agenda about repurposing agricultural subsidies. The Farm to Fork goes in that direction. It is a complicated debate. We had actually hinted it also within the G20, but with uncertainty about the American administration and very different position, it is not easy to, to have a conversation on how you can use existing money spent on agriculture to make it go towards more sustainable investment and less harming uh, spending like certain chemical fertilizer, et cetera. That very advanced agenda could be uh, discussed uh, also in, in context of the Europe Africa because spending the money better that exists uh, even before spending new type of money will be very crucial towards uh, healthy diets and, and uh, food system transformation. I'd be very happy to take questions both on these uh, ideas about uh, trade, the role of trade, the role of Europe, but also of course about the G20 presidency, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Francesco. Um, uh, with your intervention, we now complete this uh, round with very sound information on the importance of the territorial approach for an inclusive food systems transformation. Uh, before diving into the questions and answers session, we have a video from the community of Portuguese speaking countries, the CPLP. Uh, the CPLP is very much committed with the promotion of sustainable and resilient food systems. So let's find out more through this video how the territorial approach is used on the policy and governance level for the food system transformation in its member countries. Video, please.
Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da Cplp, ESAN Cplp, e foi instituído o Conselho de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional da Cplp, com SAN Cplp. A Cplp possui um enquadramento institucional capaz e adequado para fazer face aos desafios que se colocam à transformação do sistema alimentar. Trata-se de uma governança que articula coerentemente os diferentes níveis territoriais e que consolidou a confiança entre vários atores, que é resiliente e que facilita a constituição de parcerias com diferentes tipologias, aumentando assim a eficácia e a eficiência da ação pública da comunidade. Juntando os Conselhos Nacionais, a governança institucional da Cplp envolve assim nove governos, milhões de agricultores familiares, milhares de pequenas e médias empresas, centenas de organizações da sociedade civil e inúmeras universidades. Os países da Cplp conseguiram uma arquitetura institucional, talvez única para a governança da segurança alimentar e nutricional. Ela é multinível, multissetorial, é multiatores e confere uma prioridade absoluta à participação plena por parte dos grupos vulneráveis a partir de uma abordagem de direitos. E essa participação é facilitada por mecanismos auto-organizados, desde o nível local ao nível global, na medida em que participamos nos trabalhos do Mecanismo da Sociedade Civil, também junto do Comitê Global de Segurança Alimentar das Nações Unidas. Portanto, esta é claramente a materialização de uma abordagem territorial para a segurança alimentar e nutricional e, portanto, para, para os sistemas alimentares. Uma visão coerentemente articulada com os objetivos do Comitê Mundial de Segurança Alimentar das Nações Unidas. Em 2018, em Cabo Verde, a segunda reunião ordinária do Consan Cplp reconheceu prioridade política à promoção de sistemas alimentares territoriais sustentáveis. No mesmo ano, realizou-se em Portugal o Fórum Internacional Territórios Relevantes para Sistemas Alimentares Sustentáveis, que marcou o compromisso de desenvolver atividades em quatro territórios piloto, no âmbito da construção de sistemas territoriais alimentares sustentáveis. O FISAS é um Fórum Internacional de Territórios Relevantes para Sistemas Sustentáveis Alimentares. Isto é um grande desafio para todos, Uh, porque o contributo de todos para encontrarmos na alimentação saudável na, uh, e nos territórios, nos tais territórios relevantes, uh, o, 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 formas de podermos, uh, para estes territórios, valorizá-los uh, numa estratégia de eficiência coletiva, uh, com o apoio uh, da FAO, uh, das Agências das Nações Unidas, uh, que desta forma podemos uh, criar oportunidades para estes territórios. Destas ações piloto, os resultados, ainda que preliminares, demonstraram a importância de se considerarem abordagens coordenadas, inclusivas e territoriais na análise de sistemas alimentares e de um modelo de governança para promover uma transformação inclusiva. As recomendações políticas resultantes do trabalho da Cplp serão discutidas pelo CONSAN Cplp, contribuindo para o fortalecimento de políticas a nível local e nacional. Espera-se que a experiência e exemplo da Cplp possam ser partilhados com os seus parceiros de desenvolvimento, como a FAO e Comissão Europeia, marcando a contribuição da comunidade para debates e decisões que terão lugar na Cimeira Mundial para Sistemas Alimentares, convocada pelo Secretário-Geral das Nações Unidas para 2021. Okay. Yes, uh, please do stay with us for the questions and answers uh, that we'll have right away. We still have around uh, 20 minutes, uh, 20, 25 minutes, and we have to, to finish. Unfortunately, time is running all the time, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so let's go right into it. Uh, for the first question, um, we have a, an oral question actually from uh, Sara Rocha from uh, Associação para a Cooperação e o desenvolvimento, atuar, uh, a Portuguese NGO. Sara, uh, you have around two minutes, and I would also like to ask for the panelists who are going to answer straight 
uh, right after the questions to try to answer in also two minutes or so, okay? So that we may have time for other, other questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Sara. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you for creating this space for a joint dialogue in such an essential topic. Uh, Actuar is a 14 years old non-governmental organization based in Portugal, and its main priority is to work towards the promotion of inclusive food systems. Uh, we facilitate a civil society mechanism composed of more than 600 organizations and around 25 million family farmers from Portuguese speaking countries. And they formally participate in the regional council for food security and nutrition, also in their respective national councils for food security and nutrition. And we act are also in the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. This is the greatest singularity of the community of Portuguese speaking countries, a multi level institutional architecture for food governance with strong social participation from the local to the global level, allowing increased levels of territorial policy, coherence and alignment. Our activities include also the use of territorial approaches to formulate local public policies and their respective food governance mechanisms in the context of the ongoing decentralization process in Africa and other regions. Uh, these activities also include facilitating, facilitating knowledge exchanges between local European organizations that work on the leader approach and local stakeholders in other countries, a matter that in our view could be strengthened through triangular cooperation initiatives. In that sense, we would be pleased to put the following question to Mr. Leonard Mitzi and Mr. Simplis. Uh, to what extent uh, will both the farm to fork strategy and the future European cooperation with Africa clearly promote the development of local food policies and governance mechanisms? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, perhaps uh, Leonard could start and then we go to Simplice. If you thank you, thank you a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you to, to Sarah. Yes, look, we there there was a debate in, in the in the chat on local short supply circuits, regional versus trade, and this is also a topic that Francesco can elaborate more. We evidently are not going or will ever go into trade bashing or globalization bashing. It's not our role, I think. And I'm convinced that trade is part of the solution. Had there not been trade, um, the COVID lockdowns would have been even more complicated and there will have been more risks and breakdowns. However, our focus is to build back better and what we are going to do in scaling up agroecology, in giving more emphasis to farmers' organizations. We are probably one of the biggest donors of farmers organizations across the globe, starting from Africa and Asia, giving a voice to the farmers, gender mainstreaming, which is part of the prioritization of the indigenous instrument, and also um, focusing more on climate change, resilience, and adaptation and mitigation, more adapting to climate change. I think what our portfolio will do, and this is what we are discussing with our delegations these days, is to put an agri-food systems at the core of a Green Deal or a Team Europe initiative when this is identified as a priority sector. Now, let's be clear and honest. With COVID, the demands of prioritization, health, education, agri-food systems and beyond are enormous. Why? Because Africa will encounter major shocks in terms of indebtedness, in terms of low economic growth. We consider that a more resilient agri-food system is a core component of this process of recovery. I think organizations like yourself, Sarah, need to engage, you mentioned CFS, need to engage in the national dialogues, in the action tracks, and let's come up together with game-changing solutions because these game-changing solutions, including agroecology, including inclusive agri-food systems, including gender mainstreaming, need to be scalable at the highest level in the UN Food Systems Summit. So 
important that we engage also with the European Parliament so that there is a robust response by the EU and its member states. Over. Okay. Over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Simply, perhaps you want to take the, the floor now to give a yeah. short answer? Yeah, th thank you very much. I think I will not say much uh, uh, apart from what Leonard has mentioned, just to, to emphasize that the, the EU and Africa cooperation in agriculture is quite well uh, embedded in the, the report that I did mention and the political declaration, where you have basically four main uh, axes. The, the first one is the territorial approach for income generation and job creation. We have sustainable land management and uh, climate action, transformation of agriculture, African agriculture, and development of an African industry and foods market. When you look at the, the various actions that we have agreed uh, on, the, the, the strengthening the local institutions and the farmers' uh, organizations are key. So, uh, and if you look at the farm to fork strategy, I think there is a full coherence between the objectives of that strategy and this uh, and uh, the, the the action plan that we have with European Union as part of our uh, agricultural transformation agenda. So yes, it will. There is coherence. The actions are there, and we think the the full implementation of these actions will strengthen the local governments and enhance the participation of local communities in the decision making. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now also have a, an oral question uh, by Mr. Celso Guerrido, Director of Planning of the Ministry of Agriculture of Santo Tome and Príncipe. Celso, go ahead. Uh, boa tarde a todos. <laughs> boa tarde. Um, primeiramente, gostaria de agradecer a organização desse evento. Eu sou Celso Garido, sou o diretor de estudo e planeamento do Ministério da Agricultura, Pesca e Desenvolvimento Rural de Santo Meu Príncipe, uma pequena ilha eh, situada no Golfo de Guiné, do continente africano. É, eu gostaria, primeiramente, de dizer que, ao nível do meu país, e acredito que alguns países da, da, da língua oficial portuguesa, principalmente, nós já começamos a ter... Eh, a questão das abordagens territoriais como prioritário devido às nossas características. Principalmente para São Tomé, que é uma ilha com dupla insularidade, é importante nós vermos a abordagem territorial, apesar de ser uma questão que já leva entre 10 e 15 anos, mas para nós é uma questão nova. E nós gostaríamos de ver essas questões na essência das nossas políticas públicas para a segurança alimentar e nutricional. Dizer que, através da CPLP, dos nossos mecanismos de articulação entre o governo e a sociedade civil, nós criamos, pela importância que tem a questão da segurança alimentar e nutricional para o nosso país, criamos um Conselho Nacional de Segurança Alimentar e Nutricional. Este conselho é presidido pelo o primeiro-ministro para facilitar a articulação entre vários atores. É nesse sentido que nós gostaríamos eh, de ver as nossas políticas públicas eh, tendo como essência o, o, a abordagem territorial, porque achamos que é a melhor forma de garantir um desenvolvimento sustentável. Por isso, a minha questão seria o seguinte. É... Para a União Africana e a, 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 a União Europeia, como é que é, acham que devem incluir nas nossas políticas, principalmente, eu falo em nome de Santo Meio Príncipe, as questões da abordagem territorial, pelo facto de sermos um país, como disse, insular, e com algumas deficiências em termos de quadro e capacitação para dar continuidade a essas atividades que nós achamos de extrema importância para o desenvolvimento sustentável do, do, do nosso país, no caso do meu país, e de alguns países africanos no seu todo. Esta é a minha questão. Muito obrigada, Celso. Thank you very much. So, Missy and Simplice, uh, again, 
the floor is yours. Perhaps we could start with Leonard and then Simplis. Yes. Thank you. So, what I will do with immediate effect is I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with our delegation handling um, Sao Tome and Principe. Uh, Sao Tome and Principe is an island. I come from an island. Um, it's not a Portuguese island because I come from Malta, <laughs> but I, I understand cri critically the demands of island states in terms of connectivity, in terms of food security, in terms of what a territorial approach is in a small island. And I think it's also important that we look into the sensitivity of island states because Sao Tome and Principe is not Mozambique and it's not Angola. Um, so um, the reality is different. Here we are speaking very general. So I think it's important that we look how Sao Tome and Principe is prioritizing agri-food systems in its programming. And what, I'm, what I'll make sure is that what we are discussing today, there is clearly a sensitivity around gender, a sensitivity around small farm holders, around research and adapting and reacting better and anticipating risks because islands will confront more climate risks. That is going to be critical in terms of production potential and in terms of vulnerabilities. So if we can construe a narrative also which reflects small island states, including Sao Tome and Principe, and also target our support in a way which is sensitive to the realities uh, of islands, I think we can do also a better job. And evidently, this will be done in close collaboration with the own based agencies. You, you, you mentioned FAO, you mentioned WFP, evidently, EFAT, and also others. So it's important that we have a one UN approach, a holistic approach to be also sensitive to the needs of, of islands like yours. Go ahead, Simplice. Thank, yes, thank, thank you ahead. very much. I think one what should be important for uh, a country like South Timor and Principe and other countries on the continent is to ensure that they have developed their national agricultural investment plans that are aligned to the uh, Malabo Declaration. I think that that is the first entry point, and, and Leonard and other uh, 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 partners around uh, this uh, in this panel will, will, will uh, agree with me that that is the entry point for agricultural investment. You need to develop that plan. Uh, unless you have a clear agricultural investment plan, you do not have a startup point. So this is important. The, the second, we are oftenly we speak about evidence-based policy, but what is critical in having a, an evidence-based policy, uh, policy is the availability of data, which more often, at local level do not exist. So uh, my, my plea here to, to FAO and the to European Union, as we are thinking of pushing forward the implementation of the territorial approach, we need to invest in local data systems because unless we have that, we will not have enough evidence to build the policies that is required to advance the territorial approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like now to turn to uh, Mr. Andreas Turner, who also has a, a question. He would like to take the floor. Um, Andreas is a member of the EU Economic and Social Committee. So please go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Hello and good, yeah, go good afternoon and uh, congratulations to this interesting uh, conference. Yes, um, I'm a member of the EUC and uh, as probably many of you know, the EUC has been for years already at the forefront of promoting comprehensive uh, EU food policy, providing healthy diets from sustainable food systems. And within our committee, we even had established a dedicated thematic group on sustainable food systems, where we continue to discuss these relevant topics. Leonard, I think he was uh, it who referred to the COVID-19 pandemic as a wake-up call, a wake-up call for change maybe, because this crisis has really underlined that um, the fact that getting food from farm to fork cannot be taken for granted, actually. Um, and this has demonstrated the interconnected 
interconnectedness of actors and activities in agriculture throughout the food system. Um, yeah, even food security, I think, cannot be taken for granted in Europe. I think before COVID, nobody would have thought about this that serious, but even in Europe, it's not for granted. Um, so it proved actually that strong local structures are important, especially in times of a crisis. And against this background, I think it's very important um, that we go for inclusive territorial approaches. Approaches They can be uh, a crucial solution here. And I think strong regional production and processing structures are an important element to contribute to food security at local and at the same time also on global level. And on top of this, they have actually the potential. So those regional, strong regional production uh, uh, structures, they have the potential to also contribute significantly to the sustainable development goal um, agenda. So I think therefore we should do our utmost to support strong local production structures. And it has been mentioned already, uh, for example, support the family farm model. Uh, another example, we need to provide transparency and information for the consumers to empower them to make more sustainable buying decision and thus to support the local or the regional economy. So I think there are several ways to go. And my question for the panel actually would be, we are not starting from scratch. So there are already several good initiatives out there. Some regions are further than others, but there's actually no need to reinvent the wheel. So how can we best learn from each other? And thank you for this uh, interesting debate. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I would suggest uh, perhaps uh, to give the floor to Benjamin Davis or um, perhaps to Francesca Rampa so that we could, uh, you know, uh, have other panelists to, to approach your, your question, which doesn't mean, of course, others cannot participate, but uh, uh, maybe this could be a, a good solution. Um, Benjamin? Sure, very briefly, no, thanks for the question. I mean, I think there, there are lots of good experiences. Obviously, we've mentioned, a number of it have been mentioned today. Uh, the TP4D is another important experience. There's, I mean, I think it's important to, it, th these are all kind of processes, local processes, which often take place, you know, out of, out of sight, let's say. And so I think it's very important, the role around case studies and discussions, South-South South learning, learning, you know, what's going on in, in different countries with kind of similar contexts. But I think it's also very important that there is a lot of experience, but territorial approaches are actually quite complex. They're quite difficult, right? And I think we've been talking about them today as if it's something kind of a straightforward policy you just implement, but they're actually very complex processes in which the incentives are often not aligned, right? And so, and they're often more an art of an, an understanding kind of how to align those incentives as much of anything, right? And these are, you know, sectoral incentives among the different ministries that might be involved between the different uh, levels of government, whether it's federal, regional, local, um, obviously all the political issues. And then clearly in political issues in terms of how to make this as much of a, let's say a transparent process where, you know, group collected organized groups, whether they're producer organizations, organizations around women, youth, et cetera, can participate and local communities can participate in these processes, right? And so that's exceedingly complex. Now we've heard from Simple say, for example, that there are big pushes towards decentralization, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa and other regions. This opens a lot of space. It opens a lot of space for this, for this to happen, um, but it's also extremely complicated. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot more need for uh, support. And again, it's, 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 it's soft skills more than, than hard skills in terms of making these processes work. Thanks. Thank you. Perhaps, so Francesco, would you like to add something? Yes. Yeah, so now to, to make maybe a food system approach a bit more practical, I, I want to point to a couple of things. One, uh, in order to have a territorial approach to the food system, as we heard, you need data. It's very complicated, climate, nutrition, everything seems to be there, water. But uh, there are a number of efforts from FAO and also ECDPM. I've also put... Uh, 
a response in the in the chat to have the reference to a simplification of the food system approach because i know that practitioner policy maker farmers still now they understand what the food system is using a full food system approach is a bit complicated but we at ecdpm also others like FAO have tried to simplify so that would be important to try to build an analytical base and a capacity in every country to really go beyond the narrative of, of a food system and being able to use it uh, in, a, in a very practical way that is not just for researchers and academics. And secondly, I would look with interest this year at the Food System Summit process, not only because the Food System Summit is important in itself, but also the model of food system dialogues that were mentioned also during the panel are very interesting because you can't build a food system a territorial approach by definition top down. And the Food System Summit dialogues is taking an approach of letting anyone contribute not only the governments, but anyone who is willing to show the case of their territory and why the system is already being transformed positively or should be transformed differently, they can organize a dialogue and that would be taken into account. The lessons from such a dialogue anywhere in the world would be taken into account for the formal preparation of the Food System Summit. That's a very interesting model and anyone should really look, get engaged on the foodsystemdialogue.org, see how to do it. It's a bit, it sounds a bit chaotic because anyone in the world can come up with a dialogue, but ultimately, maybe a bit of a, of a bottom-up approach would be useful to learn from others. If you read the, the dialogues uh, from China or whatever, Peru, you end up finding interesting things also from Africa and vice versa. So I would also encourage people to really dive into the food system dialogue uh, process. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Miss Carolina Estroye from the uh, Instituto Camões, you know, changing from Portuguese to English, it makes a very funny accent. I'm so sorry for this. Um, so, uh, Miss Carolina Stroya, go ahead and put your question. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, let me first congratulate FAO for the organization of this seminar and particularly today's speakers. Uh, before I present my question, let me just introduce myself and give you some examples of projects that work in sectors where the challenges concerning territorial food systems and healthy diets on stands. My name is Carolina Stroia and I'm currently Head of Strategic Partnership Unit at Camões, the Portuguese Develop Development Agency, whose mission is to propose and implement the Portuguese cooperation public policy. In this sense, Camões promotes finances, co-finances, and manage several programs and projects in partner countries with a focus on CPLP countries. Among these, I would like to highlight those which being EU projects are under our responsibility in any direct management and linked with today, today's discussion. So the first one, the support program for the Global Alliance Against Climate Change in Timor-Leste, GCCCA, which operates in territories impacted by climate change with the objective of improving the sustainable management of natural resources and increasing the food resilience of the most vulnerable populations. Second, the integrated support for rural development project, ATIVA, in the regions of Bafata, Tombali and Kinara, territories in Guinea-Bissau, where most than 70% of the population is below the poverty line. Thirdly, the project for strengthening resilience and food security in Angola, Freza, whose objective is to contribute for the reduction of poverty and vulnerability to food insecurity in the southern province of Angola and also a project to support export-oriented agricultural value chains in São Tomé e Príncipe. These projects are just to name a few examples and represent a global budget of around 65 million euros and increasingly need, with no doubt, an inclusive territorial approach. However, although our, our need and priority is to reinforce this approach in our current and future projects, we still face several challenges. Let me just say two of these challenges. First, due to the difficulty adjusting ongoing projects, either due to the contractual requirements under delegation agreements, or even sometimes due to the need to reinforce the theme in the EU delegations in countries. Secondly, related to the need to build our staff's technical capacity on this approach. So my question to the speakers is what measures to take in short term to prioritize these approaches in ongoing EU funded projects as threatening capacity building in this area? Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. I was looking at time and uh, time runs really, really fast. So, um, unfortunately, uh, we'll have Mr. Leonard now and then I'll have to make the concluding remarks. Just let, let me just say that um, I, I feel a little bit less worried because I've seen that most of our panelists have been answering to the direct questions. And I thank you so much for this. So um, uh, perhaps, Leonard, you would like to uh, give a word now to answer thank you. to Carolina? Thank you, Isabel. And uh, Carolina, I think um, I know the Frezan uh, initiative and project in, in Angola. We have good cases, uh, but we need also to be honest amongst the international community to, to say what's working, what's not working, and what the problems are in a frank and transparent way. I think what the Portuguese presidency, what FAO are doing, and what um, maybe across the institutions we could do in the run-up to the UN Food System Summit, and I, I know that the Portuguese presidency is, is planning something in the run-up around May, why not use a bit our legacy of the period 2014-2020? Um, in the Portuguese-speaking countries, the realities that were also mentioned in Sao Tome, in Timor-Leste, Mozambique, I visited Mozambique, it's one of the few countries that I visited um, since I joined uh, INTPA uh, four years ago. Um, I think there are good cases, but we need also to be smarter in terms of how we tackle territorial approaches. And something which we didn't discuss in detail is the role of digital. Um, because digital is part of the solution, but it's not an automatic, automatic solution. We saw it in COVID in terms of e-commerce, in terms of connecting communities, even in Brussels, sometimes e-commerce didn't even work, let alone in maybe far-flung far countries. So I think, uh, Isabel, if we can pool ideas uh, with Comoish, with uh, um, the ministries, with the parliament, with FAO, and come up with what I call a solution-based people-centered approach. This is what uh, Kalibata is asking. And because we know what the problems are, we know what the solutions are. It's a question also of identifying and making it happen and identifying what are the bottlenecks so that what's blocking ideas, initiatives, processes, even from a bottom-up approach, uh, similar to what Sara said uh, in terms of NGO engagement and stakeholder involvement, we deblock them and we let private investment flow, inclusive private investment and good uh, policy making to accompany this process. Thank you Over. very much. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, um, I just feel a, a little bit more relieved because I saw that our panelists have gently answered some of the questions uh, that were here in the question and answers box. And I'm sure they will be available to provide further information if contacted. So uh, a big thanks to our panelists for this most informative exchange and also for their presentations. Um, thank you so much also to Etuar, to the NGO, the Portuguese NGO from uh, Coimbra for providing the translation today, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, something that we uh, very, mu very much um, uh, appreciate and we are grateful for. Um, time runs and uh, obviously we would all love to stay here longer and talking to each other. But one thing is for sure, this is just one, uh, one first series of dialogues that we are having with the Portuguese presidency. So we will be continuing uh, this dialogue, this exchange. And I, I'm very happy to be able to uh, already announce that a second dialogue will be held in the end of the first semester on the topic of family farming. So if you want to be certain, uh, um, if you want to be certain to receive the, the invitation and it will be wonderful to have you there, please do stay tuned and follow the FAO on Twitter, uh, FAO Brussels, at, at FAO Brussels, and sign up to the newsletter on the, FAO, on the FAO Brussels website, where you will find updated information on the United Nations Food Systems Summit. 
So once again, thank you very much. It has been an honor, a pleasure, a great pleasure to be here with you, to be invited to moderate this, this uh, wonderful uh, event. And thank you also for your patience. And uh, I hope everything was, um, um, was good in terms of my, of my capacity to deliver uh, the message as a moderator. But the, um, the, the big stars were you, you the panelists and all the people who joined us today. So many people uh, for more than half, uh, one hour and a half. So thank you so much uh, and have a nice day. See you very, very soon.